guys welcome everyone to this product talk series by pragmatic leaders uh, we are glad to see you all here uh, so before we start today's session i would like to give you a quick brief about pragmatic leaders at pragmatic leaders you all are part of global family of aspirational professionals who proactively help each other and are invested in each other's career growth a uh, pragmatic leaders functions like your full stack global career accelerator that rests on three core pillars uh, pillar one is educate we help you upskill via uh, proven courses and scientifically backed pedagogy uh, pillar 2 is uh, engage we run a global community of product managers on slack with access to online and offline meetups uh, pillar 3 is employ uh, with over 79% of placement success and 600000 of cumulative salary hike we operate a job platform and dedicated interview preparation courses to help you crack your dream job so uh, with that uh, note we can begin today's session uh, apurva has already joined us uh you all know a uh, little brief about apurva uh, but yeah apurva we would like you to take the session forward from here sure uh thanks piyush um good morning everyone i know people have joined from uh different parts of the world uh why don't you type in the chat where you're joining from so that i uh get to know where people are joining from today mumbai boston new york Awesome. So, all the people. Um, good morning from California, and good evening to people who are coming from the eastern part of the globe. Uh, with that, I'll get started. Um, okay. Uh, a little about myself. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Apurva. I'm currently a senior UX designer at AWS, where I work in its databases, analytics, and AI pillar. Uh, I started my design journey from back in India. I have a bachelor's in design from IIT Guwahati. Then I moved to United States, did a master's in human-computer interaction from George Institute of Technology, and uh, since then I've been working with teams and companies, both big and small, leading end-to-end -end design for products, features, and also helping teams set up a user-centered design-first uh, product development processes. I've been in the design industry for about 10 years now, and you'd think as a UX professional, uh, we would have access to user data, user information, their needs, their motivations, their behaviors, but that's not always the case. Um, a lot of times you don't have access to the users, or people would confuse market research with user research, or there isn't uh, any buy-in. uh you're also limited by resources a lot of time you don't have enough funding or a uh, personnel who would conduct a user research for you so today i want to share my experiences with you and the uh, research methods that have helped me gain uh, user insights and something that can uh, that you can leverage for your products and services uh before we start why do we need to know our users so one of the biggest things or a big mistake that teams do that they would design something or build something based on what based on their version of what the product should be like they fall prey to their own cognitive biases something known as known commonly known as false consensus bias wherein people think that how i work and enact in a certain context other people would work in a similar fashion but that's not always the case you're not your users and that's why you need to know more about your users needs and what they want out of your product to design a and build a successful product also you must have seen this diagram a million time now that a successful product is made out of the confluence of user needs uh, your product's technological prowess and the business goals and the most uh, overlooked item out of these three pieces are the users to give you an example from samsung uh, early on samsung and other tv manufacturers would build technologically sound products sound tvs so they would uh, invest a lot in how the display should be how the audio should be and you'd see early versions of tvs looking like boxes uh around 2007 when they ran a user study and went into their users home they found that uh people think about TVs not just a technology piece but as a part of the furniture 
So while they were uh, using this expensive TV, they were not showing its technology off. They would just hide it because it just didn't fit in their living rooms. So at that point, uh, Samsung changed their design strategy. And now you would see TVs that blend seamlessly into your living rooms. So that's the power of knowing what your user needs are. You not only make products that are usable, but are valuable to your users. So you know that knowing users is great. Uh, it would help you build great products, but when do you test them or when do you go to them and ask for their opinions? So I'm gonna piggyback on this uh, design thinking framework. Uh, different teams, different companies have a, their own version of it, but you can use research methods across these different stages when you're planning and scoping out your features or when you're generating ideas and um, iterating over them or evaluating. Even after you've launched a feature, you can reach out to users to uh, get their feedback. So I'm gonna dive a little deeper into each one of these and talk about some methods that you can leverage. So customer discovery. Um, I'm gonna give an example of how Amazon does this today. So at Amazon, it's always day one. Uh, they have institutionalized a, a strategy wherein every time you build a new product or a feature, you have to answer a set of questions. Uh, which relates to who your primary users are, who's going to benefit the most, how does things happen today, and how would your product or feature help the users and different stakeholders uh, do their job a little better, and uh, how it's going to improve the current process. And uh, it's no surprise all of this data is going to come by talking to your users and customers. So uh, this part of the research commonly called as a generative or explorative research has two sections. One is the primary research, wherein you talk to the users. So something that has helped me um, for, all, for all these years is doing a contextual inquiry. You go, to, you go where the users are and understand how they do a task, how they feel when they do a task. To give you an example of one such research method, which is shadowing your users or doing a ride along, uh, a few years back, a friend of mine working in Motorola, he was designing mobile input for police officers and he did a ride along uh, in the police car to understand what kind of things happen in a day of life of a policeman and where do they involve inputting stuff on their mobile devices. Um, also, I worked on a project where we wanted to improve um, the experience of bike riders and group bike rides. So we went along a bike ride around 10 miles long and realized that there were a lot of problems in communicating. There is a lead in front of the group, at the end of the group, and you can't use mobile devices. You cannot call and ask, hey, are you okay? Is, is anybody left behind? So you you feel and you experience what your users are experiencing and you're better equipped to design and build successful projects. If you cannot go to your users, you bring your users to you. And that's happen, that happens in a controlled environment where you set up something in a lab or in your office and help them uh, uh, create a mock environment where they can do their tasks. So uh, a while back uh, when we were working for Microsoft designing a note-taking application for their Surface notebooks, we recruited a few college students, uh, pulled a online a lecture and ask them to take notes. So not only it helped us understand what kind of notes and how they take notes, but also it helped us keep our biases at bay. We made a few assumptions that, okay, if we are making notes, we want to highlight something, we scribble around. And when we saw college students doing exactly that, it kind of suggested that we have made correct assumptions. So not only does talking to a user or understanding your user uh, keeps your biases at bay and give you more information about them. It also helps you uh, confirm the assumptions you have made. Uh, one thing that you can follow up your shadowing or um, any activity-based setup or contextual inquiry you do with user interviews. So you can set up or design a script 
for the questions that you want them answer and then dive deep on um, on what their answers are so if they're saying something you want to dig a little deeper to understand why they do what they do and why are they saying what they're saying uh, another important uh, user interviews are doing subject matter experts, talking to them and understanding what the industry setup is like. So give you a, to give you an example, I recently wrapped up a research study wherein I was talking to users to understand their process, their pain points. And when I spoke to the subject matter experts, uh, within first five, 10 minutes, they were able to give me insights on, okay, how things are set up when people reach out to them, what kind of questions they ask. So all in all, it helped me form a good worldview of what my users feel and do and what the correct process is while talking to the industry experts. If all of this doesn't work in the sense you don't have access to the users, a good fallback option is running a survey. While this would not help you with qualitative uh, information or establish causality, it would still give you some pointers to start working off of. Another good way of uh, doing uh, the or supporting your initial research is called the secondary research. So primary is where you're talking to the users. So the primary research is where you're talking to your users or customers. Secondary research is where you're piggybacking on any existing body of research, also known as lit literature research. You're looking at books, you're looking at research papers, white papers, and so on and so forth. Also a good way to know how your users are behaving on your product is looking at your analytics. Product analytics, web analytics, if you're set up on any analytics product, that's where you can get the get this data from. Also forums, go on to Reddit and see how your uh, product is performing. Sometimes you'll get good insights on how your uh, users are feeling about using your products. Uh, not only external public forums, but if you have an internal forum for your own product, that can also help get some feature requests. What is it that their users are wanting? Where are they feeling the most pain points on? And so on and so forth. It's also an opportunity to recruit certain users for your user interviews to get more insights on why they are facing the problem they are facing. Um, the other thing is looking at your competition. Not only does it help you understand what's happening in the industry and in the market that you're working in, but also what your users are used to looking at. And sometimes some features that your competitors support can become table stakes. So it helps you give an idea of, okay, what's out there? What are my customers already used to seeing? And what should, be, what should I be building as an MVP, for example? Um, at this stage, what kind of deliverable would you produce? You've collected all this data, you ran some analysis on it. Um, a good deliverable at this stage is creating a persona, which talks about your, their goals, their frustrations, their personalities, their work styles, any quotes that, that truly describe that persona type and so on and so forth. And this is something that you should be sharing with your executives so that everybody is aligned on, okay, these are the two or three personas that our product or feature would target. Another good artifact at this point is uh, creating a journey map or a scenario map. Uh, to give you a quick example, this is an extension of the persona, which talks about at different stages of your product life cycle, how are they feeling? How, what things are they doing? What tools are they using? And what is the opportunity or uh, the design ramification for your product based on this data? Other example, uh, other artifact that you can build is also creating a journey map or an interaction map, talking about what different personas are involved or different stakeholders are involved in the, in the entire life cycle. And at what point do they feel happy about your product or there are pain points and there is a need for an intervention. All of these actually help uh, get your executives aligned on a, a, on a common goal that you can start working off of. This is, a, this is an example of a project that I worked on uh, with eBay Enterprise, wherein we created this journey map after doing some 10 interviews with our users, with our subject matter experts, and we shared it with the team to align on 
these are the points that are these are the points of pain points that the users are having or different persona types are having and these are the recommendations that you that we should be follow up following up on the second stage is eye regeneration so you would think that okay now this is an hands on activity we just need to go in conceptualize create a lot of ideas but there are certain methods that can help you be grounded in your user needs so the goal here is to generate multiple iterations uh, aligned with stakeholders get preliminary requirements ready um, and iterate often and fail fast so a few methods that can help you the first one being doing a cart sorting or a tree testing this is helpful to identify the navigation or the information architecture for your feature or your product um how this is done is you bring a few users in or stakeholders in and show them a few cards and ask them to group them together logically what this method helps is align a user's mental model with your product's concept model good products are formed when the mental model and the concept model aligns and this is an opportunity for you to to group similar information uh, together the other aspect or the other method that you can use is doing co-creation workshops so uh, a few months back i did a brainstorming workshop with our entire team we were designing a dashboard for an upcoming product and um we set up and being remote it's it's always a challenge that you cannot have that level of collaboration that you would like but still invited the entire team and asked them about what they think should the dashboard have what kind of widgets what kind of information would be helpful to our users not only this helped us uh, get a lot of ideas in a very short time but we were also able to identify uh, what would the mvp look like how we can phase some out some things out uh what kind of apis would be required or data would be required to be able to show the information or the level of information that we have been discussing so a lot of these workshops and these collaboration sessions uh help uh help you bring stakeholders on board but also create a lot of ideas in a very short time um the third one is ad hoc testing so we've created some ideas use your coworkers your friends and your family to uh just test out if they can understand what's happening can they successfully navigate can they perform the task if you if you ask them to do some uh, a particular thing uh this helps you identify your usability loopholes early on and help you iterate faster and fail faster even before it goes into the development cycle um a few deliverables on this stage is you want to consolidate your user flow uh, a good example that i found online was a slack's notification flow chart so while you think you're just seeing a notification it actually undergoes a a good amount or a good chunk of if and then states if and then statements back in the back end so you at this stage you want to have an alignment on what your user flow looks like what your information architecture look like of uh, your key requirements for your feature key kpis that you will you will be measuring the success and the failure for and if possible preliminary wireframes coming on to the testing experience so you've identified and narrowed down on a few experiences or designs and now you you've either prototype them or if you've already built them and now you're wanting to understand are users able to successfully complete the task can they understand the information that's been presented to you to them uh what part of experience do they love what do they hate are there any improvements that can be made is this feature truly launch ready and this part of the research which is commonly known as evaluative is it has a lot of research methods that you can leverage a few that i've used over and over is uh doing a usability testing so you have a prototype it can be high fidelity set up on envision with with some click throughs or uh even higher fidelity where you have your data uh data pipeline set up and um, truly automated some of these steps so you walk the users uh through the prototype and you can either do some quantitative testing wherein you log how much time they take to complete the task the number of interactions they're doing to achieve a goal and in general doing a task analysis this will give you some quantitative data points 
If you are looking for more qualitative, then you just uh, accompany your port prototype walkthrough with a semi-structured user interview. So you ask them the questions as they walk through. You ask them to think aloud and talk about how, how they're feeling or they're understanding things that have been showcased to them on the, uh, on the interfaces. Uh, another good uh, method for assessing web usability is the system usability scale. So after you have walked your user through your web product or a prototype, you ask a set of 10 questions that they grade on a Likert scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And there is a method to convert the, their qualitative answers into a score. Uh, and if the score is about a certain threshold, that means you have a good usability on your uh, on your product, on your web product. So if you want to get a quantitative measure, SUS, uh, system usability scale, is a good method to use. Uh, a lot of times people also get some professionals to do a heuristic analysis. And I've linked all these things at the end of the presentation because going into into just one of these methods can take a full hour. So I just want to walk you guys through what are the different methods available to you uh, for different stages. So coming back to the heuristic analysis, it's a set of 10 principles that you judge your product against. And based on that, you're able to identify the problems on low hanging fruits, so as to speak, uh, that can be fixed. If you're wanting to test your visual design, a common test to do is a five second test. So you show the visual of your interface to the users for five seconds and then ask them what they remember. If they are able to remember the content that you want them, uh, or which is the most important on the interface, uh, your, uh, your screen or your interface has passed. Otherwise you have to rethink your visual hierarchy and how you want to place the information that has been presented to the users. Uh, doing a content review. So when we were when we were working on a auto loan product, there are a lot of industry jargons around interest costs, total savings, interest savings, and we weren't sure exactly what the users would understand and uh, would relate with the most. So we put a few versions of the designs and asked them which one uh, they understood. One, if they understand what it's showing, and two, which one would they prefer? By the virtue of that testing, we were able to identify, okay, users are relate the most with these three terms, and that's what we placed on the interface. Um, if you are looking for accessibility testing, uh, there are a lot of online checkers available for you, or you can run a full-fledged testing to make sure that your products work well with different uh, assistive technologies out there. Um, deliverables at this stage is you want to make a list of improvements. You want to make sure that what you put out, you're putting out your best foot forward. So you can make the improvements that you have saw in the uh, during your usability tests or different tests uh, you can do goal based reporting based on okay this is the this is the amount of time a user takes to accomplish does it meet your re requirements or does it meet your performance standards or not uh, using quali uh, quantitative scores like sus or nps to see uh, nps is the net promoter score uh, oh, to case how good your product yeah. is uh, what are the recommended next steps? And of course, user codes. Uh, user codes is a very strong tool to, to showcase what your users want. This you can use across the entire life cycle or your product life cycle, product processes to, to, to show the impact of what your users really feel and want. Now it's all a done deal. You've launched and you're monitoring the KPIs you, that you had defined and uh, seeing that, okay, is your product performing good or bad? Uh, the primary goal in this stage is uh, how is my feature doing? What's working? What's not working? Uh, is there any critical feedback, any areas of improvements? Uh, do I need to optimize something to improve my KPIs? A few methods here is, again, uh, going back to your analytics and looking at how your KPIs are doing, if there is a, uh, an area of improvement that you need to look at. 
So for example, if you're looking at your signups and user acquisitions, is it going up? Is it going down? How much is the churn? How much is the attribution? And can you enhance something? Can you maybe change the text on the button or can you change the layout to see if uh, that would boost up the KPI? Uh, a good method to do that is A-B testing where you can try out a few versions, see what your users are liking and then launch it uh, and uh, make it uh, the de facto uh, control for your products. Also looking at support ticket analysis. Uh, this is a good way to see what kind of questions users are asking about your product. Um, always keeping an eye on this across your product lifecycle is helpful to make sure you're on top of uh, what your users are saying about your product and what are their major uh, areas where they get stuck. Again, looking at the forums and looking at what your users are saying in different uh, social channels. Uh, artifacts here is if you find something which is not doing well, you want to do a deep dive, uh, list down the improvements and next steps, and then basically rinse and repeat. You identify the areas of opportunity, you go back to your users, uh, ask them questions, learn about what their needs are, get back to your drawing board and release something that is valuable to your users. So in summary, uh, when you gather this data, you can gather this data across all the uh, stages of your product development process. Uh, they each have a different goal and would help you achieve different, uh, uh, different sets of answers and help you align with different stakeholders, help you answer difficult questions, and truly keep you grounded uh, in your users and your users' needs, uh, their aspirations and their motivations. While this is in no way an exhaustive list. These are some methods which you can use when you are short on resources. There are a lot of methods out there like eye tracking, heat map tracking, uh, which requires specialized equipment. Uh, if you don't have access to it, these are the methods that uh, you can use to gather the insights from your users. So, when you get this data, when you understand more about your users, you're truly able to empathize with them. You can feel what they're feeling. You understand their needs a little better. You know why they are doing what they're doing. And you're, you're able to build and ship more useful, usable, and human products. And I know a lot of people out there are product people. So while this is all uh, mushy talk, let's get to numbers. So what this would help you is it will improve your development cycle. You will have a shorter cycle versus doing costly fixes down the road. If you identify the problems up front, you're able to fix them uh, before it becomes a havoc or cost you more. Uh, if you've made a product which is usable and which is user friendly, you will see a reduction in customer support, which is equivalent to your uh, reduction in your cost that goes to your uh, to customer support. It helps better collaboration among stakeholders. Now, because everybody is grounded in your user's need, it helps in faster alignment on contradictory ideas and helps you make informed trade-offs. Now you're not making trade-off based on a gut or based on deliberation, but based on what your users really need. You define your MVP accordingly. You ship products based on what your users are requiring you to do. And all of this leads to a culture change. You're not now asking, what should we do now? But you're replacing it with, with let's ask a user. Let's see what they want and make decisions based off of your user's needs. And it also helps uh, track your user uh, ROI on your user experience. Um, at more, more than um, often, you'll see that uh, UX user experience research is often an afterthought, but by showcasing that, yes, your users are truly liking uh, the product, your sales have improved, your customer um, investment has reduced, you can uh, continue investing in UX. Uh, with that, let's start knowing our users. Thank you. So we can open up for questions. Uh, I'm seeing a few questions prop up on the chat. So uh, Piyush, how do you want me to do this? 
yes we can pick up the questions from chat guys you can speak up if you want or you can put your queries in chat section we'll pick them from there we can start the question uh, first question i can see is from akansha uh, do you base your personas need and behavior based on different people you have interviewed uh correct correct so um, when you when you talk to a user you are able to identify uh, a process that they're doing uh, up front so uh, to give you an example when we spoke to the user about the auto loan products we were able to identify uh three kind of users one who um, actually two kind of users one who would want to save up front so who would want a lower um lower apr or lower interest rates and want to save up front versus people who are who were okay to uh you know shell out a few bucks every month uh but they wanted a cheaper loan up front so they were okay if uh, the apr was high and it's longer uh but they wanted to save uh save bucks monthly so by talking to the users we were able to identify themes that were occurring again and again and we were able to identify okay these are the two groups of user who would help us uh design the content on the interface um uh, moving on to the second question uh from mathangi uh could you tell us the tools that we can use for creating the journey map or story map yes of course so uh, there are a lot of tools out there i've linked one um in the chat it's called uh, sorry in the references it's called extensio uh it provides you with a template of uh, or oh, what kind of data you can insert the other way and i'm going to go back a few slides you can reference this as a template and that's uh, why i put it on the deck is uh, like for each of the personas uh, and along the different stages of your product life cycle what are what is what are they thinking what are they feeling if you have measured any scores what they do what tools they um, use and what does this mean uh, for your designs also a simple um, this is this is uh, use, using a design software but at the very least you can just make a flow diagram talking about the different users and what are the different stages so basically what you're doing is taking this up and converting into a flow diagram and uh, chalking out into the entire for the entire life cycle of your product what are the different personas and different users are doing and what are their pain points and all of this data you're going to get when you're talking to your users and gather data from them okay i see a lot of questions on journey maps uh, are there any specific things that you want to know about okay uh i guess no i'm going to oh, where to start on the journey map uh vijay do you want to speak up and ask your question uh, what are you trying to get to uh tools and names uh yeah so one of the tools um there are a lot of tools which you can use to draw these things out as a designer i use adobe products uh illustrator or xd or a uh, sketch but you uh you know this can be done even on powerpoint all you need are are some boxes and label them as your users and draw out a flow diagram you can also use uh any flow diagram uh tool like draw.io or miro or even freehand that envision provides so what i would suggest that you should not be limited in in the tools but think about what how to best showcase the information that you've learned uh from your users if nothing works just pick up a pen and paper and draw it out chart it out and just hang it in your office and and 
do something like a gallery uh, visit from your executives head have them walk around and see what your users have talked about and uh, that way they'll be able to empathize as well uh, based on the data that you have collected okay so the next question by rk is how do you work with product managers who decides about the product features? Uh, that is a great question. Um, so what I have seen working all these years that uh, product managers, your designers or researchers and your uh, development leads work as peers, as colleagues and decide what the product features are. And that's an ideal scenario. If they work in confluence and they are able to bring their unique perspectives around what are some technological constraints, what are the business goals versus a designer would talk about, okay, this is what the ideal user experience be. And based on these discussions, uh, you can uh, carve out your features and uh, honestly, you can decide, okay, what should be an MVP? What should be phase one, phase two, phase three, and so on and so forth. Uh, that's what we have been doing. Uh, we, we come together, we decide on, okay, this is, this is what our users truly want. So going back to the working backwards um, strategy, what is it that, are you, that the users want? How can we achieve it? If this is difficult to impl implement in the first go, how we can phase this out? So, um, in an ideal scenario, you want to work closely, um, not only with your product managers, but also your designers and your development leads. Uh, moving on to the next question from Mohan, uh, do we need to update customer journey maps, user flows once the feedback on the product increment is launched to the market? Or is this activity just happens during the planning phase to produce a product increment? That is a great question and you bring up a good point. These documents, these artifacts you create should be living and breathing. They should be updated as and when you get more insights. Your product evolves and so do your users. Now you have your users who are using a certain version of your product and now they have different kinds of needs. They've moved past their original needs that you uh, would have already solved. So these documents should also be updated based on the information that you keep gathering. And this whole process of talking to the user should not be a one-time thing. You should be continually talking to them and getting their feedback because this would ensure that you're always building products that are catered to, the, to your users. All right, um, Sheetal Sheet is asking, give more examples of user journey maps. Um, what kind of examples are you looking for, Sheetal? Um, um, all right. Hi, Apurva. Hello. Uh, hi, this is Priya here. Uh, thanks for the packed presentations. You've covered all the research methods there. So I think the question everyone has on journey map is that, so once we complete the primary research, right? So we have heaps of data over there. So mm -hmm. how do you go about analyzing them and converting them into uh, any deliverable? It could be personas or journey maps. So is there a particular technique that you use or template to bring out that deliverable? Uh, sure, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, and um, I'll, I'll link those, I'll update the deck and uh, link those out as well. So there are a few ways that you can do it. Uh, one of the methods for analyzing is called affinity mapping. What you do is you now have this huge data, as you mentioned, uh, about what your users needs are, what their pain points are, what kind of process they do, what they want in an ideal solution and so on and so forth. So you pick up the sticky notes or uh, you start uh, pulling out some themes. So to start with, a, a good way to do it is following the AEIOU uh, 
it's a e i o u f just paste it in the chat uh it's activities environment interactions um uh users and i'm forgetting what o is so you start with okay what kind of activities are they doing in which environment are they doing it what are the kind of interactions are they uh doing to accomplish the task um i'm forgetting what o is and i'm going to link that out and then the u is called the different kind of users so while you define your personas your personas can be primary uh, objects thank you um so objects are basically what kind of uh, tools you are using uh, to accomplish those interactions and then users are your primary users who are users who are actually doing the task versus secondary users who may be helping uh, the user accomplish the task or are influenced by the uh, by your product or by the task so say for example if you're buying if you're creating a toy for the kid your primary persona is the kid because they'd be ultimately using it but your secondary persona is the parent because they'll be buying it and their decision would drive what kind of toys the kids use or play with so you define these levels of your users and uh, you start with that and what you'll find is when you're putting these uh, these groups together you'll start seeing some patterns and you'll start seeing some trends that will help you draw out the journey map so one way of doing it is uh affinity analysis the other way uh is you basically transcribe all the data and you start looking for codes and you start looking for trends uh most of the time the affinity mapping has helped in identifying those trends because it's it helps you start with a template but you can always move things around based on what based on the context of your product maybe you don't want to assess on activities and environments maybe you just want to assess on what are the pain points uh what are the areas of difficulties what are they liking the most so as you keep doing it you will start understanding what kind of themes you want for your product and start analyzing the data based off of that great thanks for the explanation yeah okay uh, i'm going back on the chat um Okay I have this question from Umang um how do we conduct user interviews in healthcare industry let's say we have an application very similar to facebook but for patients uh and disease okay uh that's that's great uh sorry that's not great if you don't have access to the users but uh, there are certain methods that you can use uh, you can piggyback on uh on literature study so um one of the projects that i worked on uh which was in the loan industry where we did not have access to the end users we were a uh, a b2b product we were selling our products to banks and credit unions whose users whose customers or members were using our product so we we didn't have direct access to our users so what we did instead was uh like uh like healthcare or your specific context among uh the the loan industry or uh the credit industry is huge and a lot of research has already been done so i looked up what kind of research has already been done and uh, chanced upon a pnc research who had identified different personas for different loans so there were personas for student loans for mortgage for um auto loans and so on and so forth so while that was not everything that i could use but it gave me an insight on okay what kind what are the users thinking what are their styles and what kind of groups are out there so we leveraged that and in and used that information to uh, help us design so while that was not the only way we also supported that information uh with the with the data from our own product so we looked at our own product analytics we were set up on google analytics where we were able to identify okay what kind of loans are people uh getting um getting more were they 16 month loan or a 48 month loan uh, are they leaning towards a lower apr or a higher uh, apr apr which is an interest rate 
Uh, that was one. And then our marketing team who was uh, marketing and the sales team who was on the front lines and talking to our partners, they were also uh, able to get some feedback from us uh, and some stories from uh, for us. We were also looking at customer tickets. So if you look holistically, even if you do not have access directly to your users, there are different ways or different hacks that you can get, you can do to gather that information. And you should always be inventive uh, in that sense. Uh, would it help if, uh, if you're not, if you don't have access to your users, but uh, there are different people who would have faced some ailment at some point can you reach out to them and ask what their what their social preferences look like or how do they access that information i'm making a few things up uh, but basically trying to if you can't get your users try to get proxy users it's not always best to get proxy users but if you do not have access uh, it's better to have something than nothing Uh, hi, Purva. This is Aditya. Hello. Uh, to the question formats and in research interviews. Mm -hmm. So, any tips on the questioning formats uh, overall for conducting user research in terms of when do you keep which questions do you keep more open ended versus which do you keep more objective? Uh, and the and the idea being to you know minimize cognitive bias from the user side and any assumptions in your own line of questioning, right? Yep, yep. So uh, when you're conducting interviews um, or questionnaires, a rule of thumb is to never ask leading questions or um, never ask uh, questions which have a yes or no answer because then you don't know why they answered that. So you always want to keep it open-ended. You want to talk about how they do it, why they do it, what they do, uh, and so on and so forth. So that's always a rule of thumb. Uh, now, if pertaining to your context or the thing that you're trying to assess, if you knew, if you say you want them to tell you which version they like, uh, so while you need a yes or no answer, you also need to ask them why they like something versus why they didn't like the version uh, of version two. So as a rule of thumb for user interviews and questionnaires, never ask leading questions, never ask objective questions and avoid them as much as you can. Cool. Does that answer Thanks. the question? Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, so how do we see, will SWOT analysis help us to come in R&D picture? Can you please elaborate this? Uh, can you ask a question again? Can SWOT analysis help us in R&D development of the product? Just mm -hmm. some insights of it. Yes, yes. Uh, one thing that you will find, uh, uh, it is also one of the analysis methods in user research, while SWOT analysis is done mostly on the market research or the product research side. So you have to be a little careful on what your goals are while you're doing your SWOT analysis. So uh, user research is multidisciplinary. It piggybacks on a lot of research methods coming from different areas, coming from business, coming from clinical research, and so on and so forth. So whatever method you pick, you want to make sure your goals are aligned. So when you're doing a SWOT analysis on your market segment, you have a different set of questions versus when you're doing a SWOT analysis on your user research data, your goals are different. Again, you want to go back and ask, who is my primary user? Uh, what are they trying to do? What are they trying to accomplish? What are they need? What are their demands? And so on and so forth. So if, you, if you've got your questions right, you can use any method and draw conclusions. Thank you, Abhuvan. It really helped. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, Yeah, I would uh, love for you guys to speak up. I think that's more collaborative and uh, more interactive. Hi, Apurva. Hello. Hi, this is Hemant here. So my question is, how does user research differs in case of B2B versus B2C scenario? Because uh, as we know that B2B case 
uh, users might be a queue in number than in the B two C scenario. Okay, um, that that's a good question. Uh, so the I think the only difference happens when you're doing a quantitative study. So when you're doing a B two B research, uh, of course you're limited in numbers, and you might you may not get statistically sig significant data when you're running a quant quantitative study. When you're doing a qualitative study, what I have found is around the seventh uh, or the eighth user, you start listening the same answers. So the moment you start listening same answers is when you have enough users. So this, this is an age old question in user research, like how many users are enough? So from the uh, qualitative perspective, uh, the moment you start hearing same answers or similar patterns uh, in the in the answer is when you know that you know you you have you found uh, a good number and you can stop your research. Uh, that's the uh, the generative part or explorative part uh, when you're doing your planning and uh, setting up context for your products. When you're doing usability analysis. Uh, usually five to seven users help you identify up to 80% of the problems in your, in your product. So if you can get to that number, that's great. But, you know, honestly, if you don't have access, any number is a good number because any feedback at that point is good feedback and help you improve your product. All right. Okay. And in surveys, uh, do the same thing. Uh, if you are not able to get the user research aspect in the person to person interview do surveys in b2b versus b2b scenario uh, generate uh, like is there any specific number we should look out for because in the same case because i have heard that in b2c scenarios you should get try to get at least like 2000 uh, sample sizes or uh, in b2c b2b cases the smaller number can do the same thing is it uh, um, honestly, it depends. It depends on, uh, so usually a conversion on a survey is pretty small. Uh, it's about two to three percent. That's what I've seen. Uh, if that's the case, um, you know, you will need a, a stronger population. And it also depends on how much confidence you want in your data. Uh, so there are, uh, like I've mentioned, if you're looking at quantitative measures, you then there are you know, different aspects of it. You have to look at, okay, what kind of confidence interval are you looking for? What kind of power you're looking for? And there are a bunch of statistic uh, jargon and mumbo jumbo that you need to take care of. So uh, I wouldn't stick to the 2000 numbers because it depends on how your, pro what your product is. Uh, if your product has a good conversion in general uh, and so if your population or if your user population follows a normal distribution or is similar in traits, then you can do with a smaller number of people uh, versus if your uh, users are very varied in their behaviors, then you need a larger number because then you need more data points to assess, uh, uh, assess the questions that you're asking them. And honestly, there's no good way to know that. Like, how would you know if you have a normal distribution or not? So there are a lot of sample size calculators out there, which you can use to assess how many numbers you need based on what kind of confidence you want. Um, and again, uh, statistically in both the cases, you will need more people. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for the That was helpful. Thank you. We have six more minutes, so I think we can take uh, one or two more questions. Yeah, good one. Mohan here. Hey, Mohan. Uh, my question is around quantitative versus qualitative research. Can you give us some examples? Uh, can you say a question again, Mohan? Uh, can you give us some examples around quantitative versus qualitative, uh, qualitative research? Methods? Yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, so qualitative research, uh, so few methods that you can use there. Qualitative me method is something which doesn't have a lot of numbers, uh, like to begin with. Uh, you're not basing it off on any data point. Uh, you're talking more on the subjective aspects of things. Okay, what are the behaviors? What are the pain points? Uh, and so on and so forth. Quantitative is something where you are now starting to log numbers. How much time does it take for them to accomplish a task? Um, how much, how many number of interactions or number of clicks do they have to do to achieve their goal? What does my latency look like? Uh, and so on and so forth. So if you attribute a number 
or a KPI to something, that becomes quantitative versus qualitative is more subjective, more behavioral, um, and uh, talks about more open-ended open-ended things. So a few good examples for qualitative studies are doing a user interview, uh, running a contextual inquiry, doing ride-alongs, doing shadow, because this is not producing any data point. It's, it's producing uh, a, a story or it's producing a use case or a journey. Uh, whereas some of the quantitative side of things are uh, running an A-B test because it's gonna give you that this is the significance by which your uh, your version one is better than version two. Uh, when you do task analysis that, okay, uh, version one helps the uh, uh, helps the user finish the task in 10 seconds versus version two is 15 seconds. So version one may be better. Uh, these are a few examples of qualitative and quantitative. Uh, hi, Apurva. Hi, Apurva. Um, I'm sorry, uh, your voice? Uh, my question is that, uh, is it better to uh, outsource the user review or survey to... Yeah, are you able to listen? Uh, yes. Yeah. Is it better now? Yes. Hello? Uh, yes, yeah. I can. Hear you. Yeah, yeah. My question is, uh, is it better to? Yeah, uh, my question is, is it better to outsource user review to uh, third party or outside company, or is it better to keep it in house? Uh, okay. The question is, is it better to keep the research uh, in house or outsource it to to some agency? Uh, it depends. Um, it it depends on one what kind of your, what kind of budget you have, what kind of resources you have. If you uh, if you don't have enough budget to have or to support an in-house team, then uh, having some data is always helpful. Uh, there are a few pros and cons of keeping an in-house versus an outsourced agency. If your team is in-house, they're closer to your product. Uh, we see this, uh, this, is, this is a similar situation, uh, like outsourcing your development offshore versus keeping it in-house. Uh, you have to make sure that your outsourced team understands what your goals are, uh, what your, what's the essence of your product, what's, your, what's the vision. If there is an in-house team, uh, they're always, uh, you know, they're closer to the product, they understand what's happening, they understand different timelines and, uh, uh, and you know, have, have that perspective, which is something that you have to make sure that you share this with your outsourced agency. So it, it actually depends on the, the resources and the budget. Uh, it's always better to have something uh, and honestly it depends on the context. Uh, but my opinion is it's better to have a team in house because they can support you long term and for different features and different areas of your product and it's not going to be a one time uh, you know a one time project. Thank you, Apurva. Sure. Uh, hi, Apurva. Am I audible? Yes. Yes. Hello. Hi. Uh, actually, Apurva, we are a bunch of techies and we are working on a product which is B2C. So what we are looking for is right now we are about to start off with the development. But before that, we want to have a feedback loop with all of our targeted audience. So do you have any tips like how to go about it? Like uh, should we you know, start uh, taking more of the surveys or how should uh, we go about it? Like any, any tips for that? Yeah. So um, from, from this diagram, you're, you're closer um, to, to the production, right? You're, you're developing it. So uh, there are a few ways. Uh, now that you're starting the development, you already have a version of design ready. So a survey wouldn't help much because you'll only get a yes and no kind of an answer that is this better versus this. Uh, the most helpful information for you at this point would be uh, whatever your key tasks are, are they able to, uh, 
are the users able to understand it and perform it? So you can set up a usability testing um, and uh, you can do a prototype walkthrough. You know, you don't, you don't need a full fledged product to test. You can just spin off a few screens. You can use Envision for that or Adobe XD for it, or just spin a few images on PowerPoint and just test them out. Uh, again, the idea is not to be constrained by tools, but getting the answers that you need to move forward. Uh, do something like that. Ask them to, you know, tell you where they click or where they would click next. Do they understand the information that's presented to them? Uh, and uh, are they able to successfully finish the task on their own? And then ask them questions that which, which, what did you like the most? What uh, other things should be added to make it a usable experience for them. Uh, this would not only help you in your first round of development, but give you a good feature list for future as well. Right, Apurva, that that's so helpful. Uh, I'm glad I, I asked that. Thank you. Of course. Uh, we are over time. Um, thanks a lot. You've been a great audience. Uh, I would link out all the resources. I know there were a lot of questions on journey maps and a few questions on what kind of questions uh, should be used in user interviews. I'll uh, link these out uh, for all of you. Uh -huh.